Can you believe that we started recording right in the middle of 2020, with all of the COVID and lockdowns going on around us, unable to meet up? So like many a young gentleman, we turned to the internet for our entertainment. Tried to find a place where we could meet up and talk about the good, the bad, and that time that Stu saw a pelican on the canal. In order to facilitate our dreams of answering all of the big questions in film, and after a few attempts at recording via other methods to various levels of success, we found Zencaster, a super easy web-based one-stop shop for recording. Log in and you're ready to record in a matter of seconds. It doesn't take a tech genius to get high quality audio or video. And on top of that, the one time we have had an issue, the fact that the multi-layered backups are stored locally means it's easily fixed all in browser. There are plenty of tools you need when you start podcasting, so let Zencaster take that headache away as it offers a place to record edit and distribute all from one website. Any Lazy Bones Jones can pick up and play and have studio quality audio or 4K video put out for the world to see when using Zencaster. Go to zencaster.com forward slash pricing and use our code cagefighting and you'll get 30% off your first month of any Zencaster paid plan. We want you to have the same easy experiences we do for all our podcasting and content needs. It's time to share your story. And now, hit the music. Ho, ho, ho. I, I can't believe we're doing an episode on Christmas Day, but it's cage fighting. We're here. Hello. The most disingenuous ho, ho, ho I've ever heard <laughs> in my entire life. Well, I tried. Grab your Brussels sprouts and let's rock and roll, because if you are listening to this on Christmas Day, by God, you're dedicated and we love you. Matt, hello. Hello. I mean, if anyone is guaranteed to end up as a fucking grumpy store Santa in about 20 years' time, it's him. <laughs> How can you not be... I mean, I'm drinking Bailey's recording this just to get in the mood. It's... It's four days away. Spoilers. For four days before Christmas, so we're doing this few people. To be fair, I voluntarily put Christmas music on which is the only time I do it in the year because um, we had our annual cheese board night, as mentioned on FanCast. Uh, <laughs> and uh, it was class, to be fair. really enjoyed it. It's less about the cheese, more about the accompaniments, really. I think we only had a couple of cheeses. We didn't have a lot. We've got loads more in the fridge that we, we overbought, as you always do. Um, but it's all about the little bits and, like, you know, the pickled onions that if you bite it the wrong way, they take your breath away. Or I really like mm. sun-dried tomatoes, so I was fucking guzzling them down like a greedy chicken. <laughs> Do chickens eat tomatoes? Uh, well, I mean, why not? It's Christmas. That's the excuse for everything, isn't it? Keep touching me, Your Honour. It's Christmas. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, you know, it's just... Then it was just all of the savoury bits and bobs and... Yeah, God, it was, it was delightful. Sounds wonderful. I, I do like a nice sort of, like, quince or some kind of jam type thing with the cheese just set it off nicely quince what? yeah i i never heard of quince until i was ordered to go buy the chutney and there was a quince chutney and um i didn't i had no clue what it was and i thought by reading the instructions i'll be enlightened but the ingredient was quince mm. like quincy jones yeah, it's spelt the same, but it's not a black man in a jab. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's that, that's what I meant. Prince, Prince, yeah. I'm sure it's Q-U-I-N-C-E to rural. Yeah, like, I, I genuinely couldn't tell you what it is. It's just really fucking nice. It's a fruit. It's a, a, a bright golden yellow palm fruit, similar in appearance to a pear. Mm, it's delicious. So it kind of comes in, like, you know, you occasionally get, um, like, an apple jam rather than apple sauce that you can have with yeah. whatever roast. Um, it, it's a similar sort of texture to that. It's, it's really nice. So f- flavour-wise, is it, like, akin to marmalade, or is it...? Um, it's lighter than that, because, obviously, marmalade's quite dense with the the, uh, the the oranginess to it. 
whereas this is quite light. There's just a hint of sweetness to it. It doesn't overpower it. It's really nice and it brings out the flavours in other things. I love eating oranges this time of year. Do you know what's better than eating a mandarin? A mandarin? Out. Eating a mandarin out. That's <laughs> all. Yeah. The old ones are the best. Outstanding. Uh, right, so we're here to give our top five Christmas films. And then we're going to talk about A Christmas Carol, the Nick Cage film from 2000, was it, gents? 2001, what, something what? like that. Yeah. Um, we'll get to that eventually anyway, but we'll we'll start with the the top five. Go around the table, myself, Matt, Stu, five to two, honourable mentions if we've got any, and then at numero evils. I'm, I'm adamant that this is the... This is the post credit scene to a cage fighting film that is the start of cage fighting No Way Home because we've done this podcast before. I don't know how and I don't know what, but it's in my head somewhere and I think I've entered a, an alternative, an alternate reality because he, I'm having the Mandela effect. I, I did have to check our running order, like the historic episodes, because it does feel like this is very much the kind of episode that we would have done at least once by now, or at least maybe a variation of it. But no, we've, we've only done we've done bits and bobs on Christmas, but we generally try and avoid it if we can. I mean, last year we went to Spy recording oh, five. <laughs> yeah, we did five episodes, just quick hits to try and get it out of the way last year. So we've not been the most Christmassy of podcasts, to be perfectly honest. But he's a disgrace for me, really. But yeah, I mean, you are the only one who is sat there in a Christmas jumper. Yeah, with with Christmas background. See, if we had video on this, people would see my excellent vinyl scene that I've got on the wallpaper. But that actually just sticks to the wallpaper on its own. There's nothing keeping it up there. When you come to rip it off, those is it dead? Then you got to buy a new one next year. No, no, no. It's like some kind of weird friction. I don't know. I don't know how it works. Um, you just, you that's what he's all the judge. Yeah, you just pull it on and then you pull it back and then he. he Sticks where you want to stick. Yeah. <laughs> what about the vinyl? Uh, yeah, that's it. Right, so my fifth bill coming in at number five. So I've gone with... Try to eat a few different things. So like my first pick is Little Women from 2019. Not actually a Christmas film, but it is a Christmas film as well. And I'm sure both of you have got films that will probably fall into a similar category. Little Women 2019, which is the Greta Gerwig version of it with Saoirse Ronan and Florence Pugh and the likes. I absolutely love that film. I, I went in with hopes of it being fun because I do like Greta Gerwig and it ended up being an absolute barnstormer of a movie. The reason that it feels Christmassy, I think, is in part because it was released on Christmas Day or rather Boxing Day in the UK, I think it was. There's so many scenes which are set around Christmas and obviously the whole thing is about how they keep coming back together and it's all about the family of the situation. Such a beautiful, wonderful little movie that it's really heartwarming and really sweet and it does give you the fuzzies that you want from a Christmas film, I think. So it works perfectly. The reason it's the 2019 version is literally because I haven't seen the original, so I don't know if that has the same impact. But I thought that the recent remake was such a wonderfully made movie that they had several time streams running at once it wasn't just a, a obvious linear a to b story there were several plots running it was, and it was just so well made as a film as well as giving you the the wintry scenes that you want from these kind of movies so little women is my first one i don't know if either of you two have actually seen this one before. yeah i have i haven't seen it now to be fair mm. yeah I'll, I'll watch it after you would wanking yourself silly over it last year um and I kind of thought, well, I normally I wouldn't watch this kind of thing, but there is something quite sweet about it. Mm. Yeah, I, I think that Greta Gerwig, she's the voice of a generation or like a specific generation of people. If you look at her other films like Lady Bird and obviously Barbie from this year, she is able to speak in a certain voice that I think a lot of people really chime with. And it worked perfectly on Little Women for her. So, yeah. That's my uh, number five. Matt? Yeah, I've also got to stay on the same route. We've not a quote-unquote Christmas film, but it's it, it's part of the season. 
Um, and there certainly has hints of it, and that would, of course, be Gremlins. Um, in 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 a new batch, they like even hint at the the silliness of talking about the Christmas in the first one, where she starts talking about how she hates Christmas and everything else. Um, but yeah, it's just set around the season, and it's it's in the same realms as Die Hard and and stuff. That it becomes just a tradition of Christmas as opposed to being Christmassy. And therein lies what, to me, is the the meaning of Christmas. And I say it's a really wanky thing to say because um, I I see it selling this to Sam. I don't remember like any of my Christmases growing up. Like hmm. I don't. They just weren't a. I don't, maybe it's just because it was we had a really small family, and um, I just don't remember any of my Christmases. So the traditions that I have now, like this, like the cheese board, and me and Sam, what are the Christmas episodes of TV shows? in isolation for the rest of the shows like we watched the royal family one and and uh, the ted lasso and uh and um peep show and stuff those are becoming the traditions now and that makes christmas a bit more a, a special mm. um and gremlins though is one that has been a bit more long-standing that i've done for a while and i've always watched it every year around this time of year and i've got that santa gizmo that looks hilarious it's always like decorated like in the house uh so gremlins for me yeah, it's a lovely film, and it's got the lovely Phoebe Cates in as well, it, which which is always lovely to see. But weirdly, you know, I think I've seen the sequel more than I've seen the original. I don't know what it is, but the sequel's the one I always seem to revisit more, for, and I have no idea why. It really ramps up the silly factor mm-hmm. in in um, the second one. Um, like, it's more of an entertaining film, I think, or a movie um, to watch. Like, you know, obviously that, horrible racist Hulk Hogan turns up and all sorts like it's just more of a like it's more akin to airplane than it is like a horror like a like a yeah. black horror film um or black comedy horror film um it's more of like a slapstick and I think that's why it's probably the better of the two really in that respect yeah big fellow John Glover as well to be fair who's in the sequel uh, speaking of that horrible racist Hulk Hogan have you seen <laughs> the doing the round on Twitter at the moment where uh, which one is that? Dumb. Is he when he's at his restaurant singing? I've seen that one. No, so there's one doing the rounds at the moment. He's recently been baptized. I don't watch that. The sins, I think. Oh dear. Yeah. From the from the brother to the father. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know what I did there? I like that, don't you? I like that. That's brilliant. Brilliant. I think the second one as well, because it is not. It's not a Christmas film. You can watch it more than the first. That mm-hmm. probably helps. Well, and unless you got a weird crush on uh, Greta, maybe. Is that her name? Or the the green gremlin? <laughs> yeah, the little one with the lipstick. No, just been here. Um, I've got I, that's weird. That is though, because I've got a load of like Christmas memories. Like, you, you you can never like pinpoint which one is which, but like I've got like blocks of things from when I was like going to my nan's on Christmas Day, and to my granddad's like when I was a kid. And then there's stuff like. When I was at home, obviously, when I when I moved out, when I was what 23, 24, something like that. Um, so I've got shit loads of them, yeah. and I, maybe that is why because there's there was always three of us, and then there was we did stuff as like with my uncles and things as well, but mainly on Boxing Day as well, things like that. So maybe that is big, bigger families. You kind of the chaos kind of gets bored into your mind. <laughs> You can't I don't want this. To, I don't want this to be a, like a, a sob story or anything. <laughs> like, I just, I just, uh, just don't have really very, very vivid memories of, of like Christmases and stuff. Which is like, I remember having the flu on one Christmas. <laughs> like, I literally was like on death door, like fucking Tiny Tim, as we'll discuss later. Except my family didn't continue to call me ill Matt the whole way. We have to have. But yeah. Um, yeah, I just didn't really have the like strong, vivid memories about things. But like, I remember family holidays and stuff. So I don't know. It's too happy. Eh? You've blanked it out of existence. Six, is that? <laughs> Some dog I stuff. Don't, I don't feel like I had any Christmas traditions or anything either growing up. Like I remember Christmas Day and always enjoyed it. But I don't like. There's some people who would go Christmas car- caroling or whatever. But there was never any of that. It was always just. Oh, you say something that's going to shock you here. Um, I think what doesn't help is the fact that I never ate like a Sunday slash roast dinner until I was 23, 24. Um, 
Yeah, so like on a Christmas day, I'd have spaghetti. A little bit. That's that's not as weird as it sounds. My brother was exactly the same. He didn't have a. He had a. I think he had a Christmas dinner around about the same age. Before that, he used to have a pot noodle on Christmas day. Is it? He didn't. He didn't like dinners. Yeah, so I mean, you know, my the grandparents on my mum's side were like Italian Irish, so it was very much that's the food we ate on a Sunday. If we were there around there, like for Sunday dinner with the family, it was it was Italian food. It wasn't um, wasn't a roast. Um, so then when he came, I, as a fussy eater, as a very fussy eater as I was, that's what that's what I ended up having at Christmas. Mm. See, I, I was I've never been a big fan of roast. I think because we had one pretty much every week up until I was about twelve years old, because that was the done thing, and it just was not a fan at all. Roast overkill. But, yeah, but no, I feel like I'm okay now with once per year at Christmas, and that's the only time that I'll accept it. I could live without them, to be honest. Other than that, I like a monthly roast, at least once a month. Stupid, why should number five, mate? So, I mean, I've gone from things and films that I've watched pretty much every, if not every year, they're on the Christmas rotation, so every three to five years. Um, rather than just one-offs that I love. Um, I know Matt was saying about how he watches Gremlins as it's his tradition, but this was a film that was based on a tradition that we kind of assume goes on in America, and that is National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation, where you think that, oh, yeah, people do go out in the sticks and chop their own trees down, and they do put all the crazy decorations up and the lights and everything, and, be, and being the 80s, we didn't do that here so much well especially not in Wolverhampton um but it's like a kind of memory of America that we obviously never had but you we, we kind of expected it to be and I generally love National Pit Lampoon's films anyway it's not I think it's not as good as the first it's better than the second it's better than the European one you don't need to watch it the others to appreciate this it's just funny it's done right and Chevy Chase is well was funny guy problematic a little bit now but whatever so who isn't um but yeah it's it's just one of them and i know it's not universally loved strangely enough for what it is maybe it's the world we live in now but i um whenever it's, it's one of them whenever it's, it's on or it's on channel five seemingly quite a lot of the rare thing and i will watch it on tv even if there's adverts even though i've got it in various formats dvd obviously and on um on a backup ROM file somewhere. But yeah, I, I love National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. It's just great. It is a good film. I should say it's definitely better than the European Vacation. Um, I'm just looking at the list of National Lampoon's films. Like, so I didn't realise how far on it went because it feels like a very 80s sort of um, production company, I guess you'd call it. And it goes right up until 2015's National Lampoon's Drunk, Stoned, Brilliant, Dead. I've never even heard of that film until this afternoon. And looking at the image on Wikipedia, I think there's a very good reason for it. One film that I see on the list that surprises me, Blackball, apparently, is National Lampoon's Blackball. You know the film with Dennis Pennison where they play Crown Green Bowls? What? Yeah, that's a National Lampoon's film. That's a great film as well. Yeah, outstanding. I did not realise that at all, but yeah, what a movie. It must be like a comic strip thing then, like the comic strip presents that we had here, because they didn't have all of them on there, and I presume that that's what Bottom eventually came from as well. Bottom wasn't the comic strip presents Bottom, was it? It was just them, the same people in Alderney, it? Minus Alexi Sale. See, it says, according to Wikipedia, National Lampoon magazine then spun off into National Lampoon Radio Era and a stage show and films. So, yeah, it does look like it might have been a group of comedians that then sort of carried on doing similar sort of films in the the same world. Mm, Very interesting. Very interesting. Right, so my number four. Let's pull my list back up. So my number four, again, it's sort of a Christmas, and it has got the word Christmas in the film. The reason it's in my top five is less to do with it as a Christmas movie and more to do with 
its actual importance to the genre of the slasher film. And it's 1974's Black Christmas starring Margot Kidder. This might be the earliest slasher movie. Someone might be able to prove me wrong on this, but I think... I'm pretty sure it like it predates Halloween, which was 78, if I remember rightly. So yeah, by four years, this is the first film of the proper, what we now know as the slasher genre. I think so many of the tropes in the modern day cinema that you see scream and everything none of that would exist without black christmas especially when you look at the setting within a sorority house there's direct parallels you can draw between black christmas and the first screen screen at the end when you see them in the house with all everything going sideways in the first screen it's very much one and the same when you look at these two it's based on the uh, urban legend the babysitter and the man upstairs where a house where a phone call is taken in the house by some creepy bastard breathing heavily down the phone. But the person doesn't realise that the call's coming from inside the house. That's pretty much the setup of the film. And it's something that I think we've seen a million times since, but this is the first. This is a very, very important film to that genre. I think it makes it a very important Christmas film because of that, because of the life it has then gone on to lead. So yeah, Black Christmas is my number four. It's an outstanding movie. It's had three, four sequels, I think, and it's also had a number of uh, remakes attempted, which none of them have been able to hold a candle to that original one. Outstanding movie. I was only talking to Tara about this the other day, um, how I I saw the last remake first. Um, Okay. I watched it in reverse, and obviously... It's atrocious. Yeah, it's it's nowhere near as good, but it, it, it was kind of... Obviously, the original looks of it seems very dated compared to the new one. Obviously, I was I didn't appreciate it properly. Um, but that whole thing about phone call from inside the house in the pre-mobile phone world is kind of intriguing as well. Obviously, there were other, other own numbers and whatever. Um, but it's just hard to imagine that that being a thing. Mm, this is like we have moved on so far. And yeah, I don't think I've seen the very latest remake, the two thousand and nineteen one. That's the one I saw. I wonder if that's mobile phones or if that's set pre-mobile phone. Because mobile phone has sort of become the killer of horror in some respects, I think. You have to think of ways around it because everyone's got a mobile phone and it makes surviving so much easier to have that technology. We we had a thing as of late. It's all gone the social media, uh, uh, Omegle or whatever, like the chat room. Like Mm -hmm. that side of it is where... You are kind of hardwired to a PC or a laptop, which kind of gives you the element of being stuck in the house element yeah. to it again, which I suppose does work in a way. Mm, yeah. Well, I think they did that in the one of the early screams, was it? Scream, where she was ty- typing in a chat room to try and get someone to help her out. And I can't remember if it was Scream or if it was something like, I know what you did last summer, or you know, one of the bastardizations of Scream. I can't remember now. It feels like a lifetime, I guess, since I've watched all those movies. It see, I think it, it was. It's not Scream. It's definitely not Scream because I watched them all again before the last one came out. Um, I'd guess it was. You know, I know what you did last summer because that's the whole point that that gets typed in the box. Mm, could have been, but I don't think I've seen that this century. To be honest, I think I saw it when it came out, so that was probably it. Mm, can't remember. Yeah, so uh, anyway, yeah, that's my number four. Matt? Uh, so my number four, I don't claim that this is like a good film. I just know that it's a film that I really enjoy and forms part of, again, those kind of Christmas traditions, really. And it's um good old jingle all the way. Um, They had uh, Stephen Merchants in some version of Jingle All The Way-esque now called Click and Collect. It's only just like come out over the last uh, few weeks or so. Sam watched it and said it was quite sweet. Um, but, you know, the I'm sure there's probably an essay somewhere of someone going, making a proper, like, wanky, arty review of it being about capitalism and the evils of the American <laughs> social system. Um, but essentially, man 
doesn't get a toy for his kid that his kid wants and, and so becomes this caper crusade, catch me if you can, uh, rat race style um, comedy film about Christmas with the best thing being the voice actor of Troy McClure is in there as well. Um, but it's just a fun, silly Christmas film where it's on like a multitude of films that you quote Arnold Schwarzenegger from and this one is no different. It's just just a fun, silly slapstick Christmas film and I really enjoy it. Yeah, it's my number four as well. Um, and it's... You're probably, a bit, you're probably a bit too young to remember it being exactly like this was exactly like it, it happened in this film especially with things like turtles um where in the late 80s i remember them i mean that was what my present was the one year though i wanted all of them um and the van and rocksteady and bebop and everything the only thing i never got was the techno drum because it was massive and it's still like hundreds of pounds on ebay <laughs> yeah it's just, there's no way for it to go even if I, even if i got hold of it um but I remember it be. I remember the news, and that, that's here as well. Let alone in Crazy Town over there, um, the news here with people fighting in shops over them, and again it happened again with Furbies later on, and and all the other nonsense, like the Cabbage Patch Kids and things like that. So these, and it doesn't happen now in the online shopping world. But oh, we're talking about earlier, but the, the whole PlayStation Portal thing. People just outbid each other now, and the people hoard it, and you, you you pay over the odds if you want. Well, you want one of these items but at that time people were stupid people did like leave it to the last minute and then you were going out and and getting into capers and getting into scraps over silly bits of plastic mm -hmm. and i think that's kind of again heading back to my number five it's a memory of something that probably happened in a way but not exactly like this film does but it's an excellent fun family film as well with some really bad CG, obviously at the end, um, but the whole the whole thing about it is so relatable, and especially being the other side of the coin now, being the parent of kids that age, um, and having to get things on time before they sell out, I can relate. <laughs> you know, I I know I'd seen this film because I know that. Paul, show, uh, Paul White, the big show, is in it. But for the life of me, I couldn't tell you anything about this movie. I I just seem to have a black hole other than the scene where you see the big show's tall. So, because obviously he's taller than the camera, isn't he, if I remember rightly. That's literally all I remember about this movie. I've got, yeah, just no recollection at all about what happened in this film. Man, I'll only ever need to be fucking sat in traffic and I look like the hard shoulder. And I bet, <laughs> and I think I'm going to drive in the hard shoulder, and I'll be as smug as Arnold Schwarzenegger. I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it. Whatever he says, I just love it. It's so brilliant. Um, <laughs> and it's like it's like it's so cheesy. It's bad at the bits when he's Turbo Man as well. Like <laughs> it's really awful, but at the same time, it's brilliant. Yeah, try and get it in if you can before um, before Christmas, mate. Because it is, it is definitely a and and Ted as well. Ted is. There is always one. There's always one bloke on the playground who's like this. And with both kids who experience this, that there is that guy who tries to be the better dad than everyone else. And he try, he, he, he's done it. He's all the, the, all the PTA meetings. He's going to help out with all the cookies and the, every activity. You think, you're an arsehole, mate. <laughs> you need to either get to the pool or get to the match. Because there's something a bit dodgy about you. And again, as we find out, um, they're always the same. It's quite interesting because it feels like Schwarzenegger went through a real run in the 90s of attempts at doing comedy that never quite came off right. You got like Junior, which didn't really work. Kindergarten Cop, which I remember enjoying when I was younger, but having watched it back over the last couple of years, doesn't really hold up that well. Last Action Hero, like he's got a few stinkers in there, but twins. People do. I mean, Twins is great, though, because let's be honest, it's Danny DeVito all the way to me. <laughs> He's the star of that film. I'm kind of worried that the third film with Eddie Murphy and he's going to shit the bed like everything else that Eddie Murphy seems to be touching at the moment. But yeah, I'll, I'll try and squeeze that one. I'm going to add it to the list, but obviously, as Stu pointed out, we are four days away from D-Day at the moment. So. Right, so it's 
back to me. My number three, I have gone with a classic film that even if you haven't seen this film, you have seen this film because you will know what it's all about. It's a Wonderful Life, which I think is possibly the Christmas film. I think when you look at stuff like the AFI 100, this is up there. With, like Usually within the top 10, it is such a highly regarded film, which is very rare, I think, for, for Christmas movies. <clears throat> so obviously it's the story of James Stewart's character who is down on his luck and decides that the world, or questions would the world be a better place without him? And then angels come to him and show him that actually the world's better off without him. Directed by the legendary Frank Capra as well. It's such an outstanding film that I I didn't see until about two or three years ago. Because again, because of it being a Christmas film, it's not something I ever really sought out to watch. And then I was listening to a podcast where they were reviewing the 100 best films according to the AFI. And that was one of them. I watched it and I felt like such an idiot for having completely ignored it for so long. Especially because James Stewart is such a wonderful actor as well. And I think this might be, like, this is up there with Vertigo and, like, North by Northwest, what's the other film? Um, Who Shot Liberty Valance? I love his performance in that one. Such a brilliant movie. Anatomy of a Murderer as well. Like, Philadelphia Story. James Stewart is one of the all-time greats. And this is one of his all-time greatest performances. And it's so heartwarming at the end when things sort of fall into place for him. It's just lovely. And the cynic in me should hate this film, but I absolutely don't. Because it has been parroted to death and what have you over the years since. But there is a reason that it has been, because it is such a wonderful tale. So, yeah, it's a wonderful life for me. (laughs) No, to to be fair, like, like, it is Christmas, isn't it? It's a wonderful life. Like, it's the quintessential, like, everyone especially of a certain vintage, loves it, and that gets passed down, and then it becomes memories for people that have watched it with their grandparents or or, or older, older relatives and stuff because they like, watched it, like, legitimately loved it from their youth. And, yeah, it is it is quintessentially Christmas, so I can understand why a lot of people uh, adore it the way they do. Mm. Yeah, I was I was just going to say, I mean, like, the first time I watched it, I was probably about three, four years old. Um, so my granddad had it on video, and then he had it on DVD as well. Um but I, I hadn't seen it for a long, long time. Um, maybe for, for that reason that I'd, I'd seen it so much. Like the Thief of Baghdad. That you can only watch something so much every single year over and over again before you get bored of it. But it probably deserves another rewatch now. And I think, like you said, I need to... I think the thing about this one, it's probably in... It's probably got more screen time without it being shown in entirety in other films. Mm-hmm as we see its own film, because in the background of every Christmas film in the last 30 years, it's always It's a Wonderful Life on the telly, every single one. Obviously, the royalties are got to be pretty cheap, or it's the same studio, but the amount of times you see It's a Wonderful Life on telly in a Christmas film, it's outstanding. Yeah, and there's so many things, like, I'm sure there's there's been a Simpsons episode where they've done pretty much the same storyline, they've followed the same plot, and there's so many shows, especially American TV, where they always try and fill their Christmas with something recognisable that we've seen this a million times, even without having seen this particular film. Like, it stood the test of time, I think, which is, is quite something to say. 1946, so, like, it's 80 years old almost. It's so standard. Uh, Matt, your number three, please. So I watched this, this is part of the Christmas rotation with the good lady, and it is Daddy's Home 2, I mentioned it in the chat the other day, the group chat. Um, The worst bit about this film is when, like, it's not a Christmas film in the sense of it's warm, cuddly and cosy all the way through, and it's all about families that don't get on, and but then they come together for Christmas for about 90% of it, 95% of it. It's only in the last five minutes where it does that and then the film like becomes terrible and it's all about having a sing song and it's awful and I hate it. But the not the like the ninety five percent on the way to there is this like it it's not a deep story, but there's, there's like there's lines to it about the different relationships between like father and son and mm. daughter and father in law and like there's all these little intertwining stories, but 
then there's like slapstickness about it that I really like. I do like Will Ferrell, and I think at this point at least that hadn't been overkill yet. Yeah. Um, whereas he's like, you know, inversion into the Adam Sandler territory with it slightly now, I think. And yeah, I mean, it's it's a sweet film and it's a funny slapstick film and it does have the Christmassy core elements of it, I suppose, where everybody gets together in the end and it's all about family and yada yada. But it's a fun ride along the way and it, it's a, a fitting sequel to the you know the original which wasn't anything christmas related at all it still keeps that vein but then injects a bit of christmas um festivity to it as well so yeah very fun film very happy it's on the rotation it'll stay there for a long time yeah i really enjoy it um again i, I got to it late um i think it was either last year or the year before um and uh, i hadn't seen the first one either so I, knowing that the first one wasn't a christmas film i kind of Slip that in in November, just so I was ready. Um, and I'm I'm very much glad of it because it's got no right being as good as it is. And no one ever talks about it, ever. I don't know why, considering it's a recent it is. It's like, oh, well, Daddy's Ham too. No. No one know Either people have not seen it or they don't think about it because it's a sequel that's set at Christmas, which is weird. Unsurprisingly, I've not seen it. It gives... Brother vibes with that fan? Well, nah, it's it, it's not as no, it's not quite as silly as that. There's a bit more of an actual human story to some of the elements of it. Um, it it's more the other guys, if anything. Um, okay, it it's definitely worth a watch because there's some really funny slapstick moments in it, and like if anything, just watch it for Lithgow, who's really good in it. <laughs> Um, okay. Uh, like, for him alone, like, the relationship between Will Ferrell and his dad and then that and then that horrible bloke, Mel Gibson, and his son, like, the the, the, rela- the relationships bounce off each other, like, to, you know, a father and son relationship who basically hate each other and a father and son relationship that are way too close and how they kind of react to each other. It makes for a really funny, like, comedy sketch almost. Yeah, you know, you know the, the, that TikTok family, the family, who, who are the ones who dance together. Oh yeah, them fucking idiots. Yeah, you, you could imagine Lithgow being the dad and them sharing the bathwater. That they're, they're that kind of close. <laughs> oh, that sounds a bit grim. I might add it to the list, but to be honest, I, I don't really like Will Ferrell. I don't like Marky Mark, and I don't really like Mel Gibson. So that's <laughs> the reason why I've not watched these three of the four May cast are not my uh, not my favourites. But John Cena's in it. <laughs> okay, okay. I follow a John Cena. I, I yeah, so, it. you know, you're not going to let one of the fans of the podcast down, are you? That is very true. Very true. Uh, Stu, your number three, please. And talking about Will Ferrell. <laughs> <laughs> the Wonderful Elf, of course. Um, which is as, as Will Ferrell as you can possibly get. Um, I think in terms of outrageous silliness, um, and just playing up to the cameras and being way over the top from the start to finish. And it's not so much about the Will. I mean, it's, that is the reason why my mom, for instance, won't watch it because it's got Will Ferrell in it and he's being very much the extreme Will Ferrell that almost like where Jim Carrey went too far, the one the, the one way. Um, you either like him or you don't. And if you don't like him, you're never going to like Elf. Um, even though you've got James Carden, which seems... A, mental choice knowing what james khan is like seemingly as a person and and obviously a bit of a a hard man after the uh certain films that he's been in in the past before this um and playing a very straight role as well to will ferrell's silliness but the just was it the whole thing is just i wouldn't say turn your turn your mind off because i've watched this is one that i watch every year without fail normally it's one of the first ones um Weary enough today, I mean, obviously for the 23rd as we're recording this, um, will be when I watch it this year just because of how things have settled. But I can't wait. I mean, I've watched it on couches before. I've watched it on my phone. I've watched it. I've watched it on telly. I've watched it on a projector. I've watched it in the cinema itself. I, I just love it. it. It's as Christmassy as you can possibly get, counting as a Christmas film with elves and Santa and presents and singing and 
the whole festive season, all that kind of stuff. It's the kind of anti Andy film, but that's why it's good. That that's entirely right because I hate it. I think it's terrible. I don't like. I've already said I don't really like Will Ferrell. I really don't like Zoe Deschanel either. So this film just rubs me the wrong way from start to finish. Just doesn't work on any level for me. I, I, <laughs> funny, it gets under my skin and irritates the fuck out of me. So it, for me, it's like this would be it towards the bottom of my list of Christmas films. Really dislike it. But that's not a surprise, is it? Let's me. <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, I kind of agree. It's too. It's. It's more. Um, is it cake than Great British Bake Off? If that makes any sense, <laughs> like it's yeah. It's just too. It's too far down that rabbit hole of Will Ferrell being dead silly and um. Yeah, it's. Too, yeah. I, I like. I get why people that love Christmas love it, though. Or I completely understand it. It's like, again, it, it is Christmas. It's just not me. But I can understand absolutely why you love it, Stu. So there's no uh, no denying why it should be on your list. Yeah, exactly. And so that just just within reach, there's an L bag here. <laughs> it it does seem perfectly Stu, really, doesn't it? Think <laughs> it to the Christmassy side. I'm quite surprised to see that it's directed by John Favreau, though. I did not realise that. I find it quite interesting because Will Ferrell has gone on to produce some really interesting works, but I think most people associate him with this silly nonsense rather than the more serious side of the, what he has actually produced over the last few years. I mean, I know he did Quiz Lady, which we spoke about the other day, Stuart, that we both mm-hmm. enjoyed, but Succession, May, December, Theatre Camp this summer, the menu. He was a producer on the menu. Like he has really gone on to do some quite interesting stuff, but he'll always be Buddy the Elf, and I, that's what I'm saying <laughs> all to him, I think. Although that's it, I didn't hate Spiritist, the musical Christmas one with Ryan Reynolds last year. Yeah. That ended up being more tolerable than I expected it to be. I only watched it because Katie likes Ryan Reynolds, but actually, he wasn't awful in the end. But. Mm. Yeah. Right. Moving on. It's my number two. And I've also gone for a classic story. It's a Christmas carol, but how do you make a Christmas carol better? You add the Muppets into it. <laughs> the Muppets Christmas. Like, we'll get on to this in a minute when we start discussing the Christmas carol that we watch. It's been done to death. Everybody has seen this. I don't think it's a great story outside of, you know, it outside of what it actually is, probably the original and then this Muppets version. But the Muppets added a new life to this movie. A bit like Scrooge did. I think Scrooge is the only other mm. one that holds up because they've taken something that's been done a billion times before and added a new element to it. So really, this one was going to be a toss-up between Scrooge and Muppets Christmas Carol. And I love the Muppets and I love musicals, so that one just edges it for me. Like, you genuinely feel for Tiny Tim in this one. Even though he's a frog, like it doesn't make <laughs> sense that you actually care about the characters that you do, but they managed to imbue some life into this, you know, hundred plus year old story. It's so wonderful and magical. And the one thing I love about it is how Michael Caine treats his quote unquote co stars like real humans. Hmm. You see how he interacts with them, like they're actually real beings and not, you know, a hand you know, on the end of a stick or something like that, which is what they actually are. It's just incredible that he treats the source material and his co-stars with such reverence, and it just works perfectly. And it's, again, this is another one where it just gives you the warm and fuzzies, and then years later they come out with a new song, and that new song's a fucking banger as well. It, like, it's so uh, good, it should have been in the original. It was. They took it out and they put it back in. It's not new oh, is that why? Is yeah. that what happened? I was going to say. It was in the video version, and when it got converted to DVD, it got lost somehow. Um, okay. A bit like um, Commando. There's a few scenes in Commando um, hmm. that were just lost for some, for no reason whatsoever. They're not like it's not like where we had that weird thing with the Matrix with the headbutts that were banned over here um, for that one one month before they changed their minds. There was a scene in Commando that was lost, and then it was brought back for the Blu-ray. 
that's what happened with this that song. It got lost in the conversion, and then it had to be remastered from somewhere else. So that's I did that's not what it's back then. Oh, outstanding! But yeah, that's that's my number two. Matt, I feel like you're going to shit on this one, and I don't know why. <laughs> what? Well, it's Christmas Carol. Absolutely not. Um, I think it's brilliant. I just uh, I haven't seen it for long enough. I think for me to be able to mm. put it on my list or anything, but like having to watch a Christmas Carol featuring Nick Cage for three minutes, um, <laughs> like has made me want to watch it to ex to expedite what I had to I had to watch over an hour and twenty. Um, it's great. Um, the seriousness of of Michael Caine in it is what makes it so good considering it's puppets and and those characters um it's so fun and silly but like the way it's carried is so deadpan um mm. excellent excellent film uh i just think you know obviously it's been done to death so how do you make it different and they do and it is special that they're able to do that mm. i mean they're showing it tomorrow in our timeline at uh, cine world at 2 p.m and I, I never saw it at the cinema, so I feel like that's going to be my Friday. He's going to be going to see Christmas <laughs> Carol. In fact, it needs to be done. Shu, I, I imagine this one's up your alley, though. Yeah, that, I mean, I don't particularly care about the Muppets, really. Um, I was ne I was never really into it, and the whole Sesame Street and all that. The whole Jim Henson thing was, well, the Fraggle Rock, I suppose. It was it was never really me. Um, but obviously, this film is wonderful. And the other gold went to go and see in concert as well. It's mm. quite annoying. The other, the, that was the thing that I didn't know. Um, quite jealous of that. Yeah. And when he sent that picture through in the seat and, it, and they played the lost song as well, mm. um, which is good. And they, that's why I didn't watch it because there was a whole thing last year where they, on Disney Plus that there was going to be this date where the, the old song was going to be re put back in again. And by the time that came, there was no time left to watch anything else. So I still haven't seen it with the full, the full song back in it yet. So um, the first song in a good 15, 20 years. I'm actually quite looking forward to that. And that is, uh, that's tomorrow night's viewing. Come with me, two o'clock. No, Cine World. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Right. Uh, mass your number two, please. So out. Uh, the only thing that I dislike about this film now is that it spawned all of a sudden this new phenomena. And I think it's in line with like these stupid diners the where people shout at you and throw their food at you. Um, is the Grinch, but obviously the Jim Carrey, how the Grinch stole Christmas Grinch. Um, but it spawned this like on the Ashford Park Facebook group, which is the Moss Eisley <laughs> Facebook groups. Like, there's even one on there now, like, hiring their services to be a Grinch for kids' parties and stuff like that. Um, we've, 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 we've fully gone dumb in our, um, in our society of we, won't, we all want to be sadists or <laughs> masochists. Someone's got to be the M if someone wants to be the S, I suppose. Um, but The Grinch itself is a film. I love it. It's just, it's so full of quotes. It's, um, you know, Jim Carrey doesn't half arse it. He puts everything into that um, performance, and it's just—it's so kind of silly. But there's 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 music and there's little hints like the keys in the bowl at the party. There's that adult side of it as well. <laughs> it's just an excellent Christmas story that doesn't take itself seriously at all. Um, and and Jim Carrey really puts on a, like a once in a lifetime performance in it that. Like he will always be the Grinch, as far as like no, they can reboot it till the cows come home. No one will ever touch that character. Uh, is it um, Benedict Cumberbatch? Is the yeah, voice is the animated version? Is it? Yeah, like great effort, but you ain't the Grinch and you ain't Jim Carrey. So <laughs> it's kind of I he's iconic in that role. Yeah, it's it's exactly what I said about Will Ferrell and Elf. And it's it's Jim Carrey's Jim Carreyness of the whole thing. Um, again, fully enough, Mum don't like you <laughs> for that reason. Um, yeah, superb. I, I remember seeing it for the first time and thinking, "Is this too much?" And, I, and it was the only one and only time I thought, "Am I too old to be watching this?" 
And then obviously I came to my senses and realized, no. Um, but yeah, that, that whole spawning of, oh, let's, let's hire people to trash our houses for a lap yeah. that we've then got to tidy up. But it's all a bit odd. Um, but that wouldn't have come from the cartoon. It wouldn't have come from an animated film. It would have come from his madcap craziness in this film, which just shines through the, the synthetic suit that he's wearing at all times. I do love those memes, though, where people are crying because someone's come into their house and fucked their kid up. Like, you must have stood there and watched him push your kid's face into the cage. And at that point, did you think, I better stop this? I, I, for that reason alone, that this film like, deserves to be enshrined because people are fucking idiots and are reading <laughs> to it afterwards, and it's wonderful. But yeah, it's, it's, it's Jim Carrey. It's his most Jim Carrey. He really does lean into that weird body comedy that he no one else is able to do, even remotely close to the level that Jim Carrey does. Brilliant. And like, if you look at the rest of the cast as well, Jeffrey Tambor, um, Christine Baranski, Molly Shannon, Clint Howard, Mindy Sterling, it's a really good cast. Much better than you'd expect for what is a Dr. Zeus story. Like You wouldn't expect it to have had, to have attracted the names that it did. Yeah, really good, fun, silly, over-the-top nonsense. I haven't seen the Benedict Cumberbatch one for that exact reason that he's not Jim Carrey. So what's the point in seeing it? It just doesn't feel like it's it's worth the, the investment of time. So, yeah. Right, number two for you, Stu. We're going to have to skip over because it's a number one elsewhere. Uh, we have got honourable mentions up next, though, Stu. So have you got any honourable mentions? Funnily enough, <laughs> uh, there's probably more honourable mentions for this than any any top four we've ever done. <laughs> um, the, the Santa Claus films, again, I don't like the, the Disney Plus series that's came with it. Shock horror. It's not as good as it should be. I've uh, heard it's terrible. I'm yeah, sitting with you, yeah. it's really poor. I watched the first what first episode last year and never watched any more. And I thought, well, I'll get around until next year. It'll be fine. And we're now on the 21st. I, I still ain't done it, so I'll just give it up now. The third film was bad enough, but the first two I, I enjoyed. Um, one that we watched last year, Violent Night. I think that's going to enter the uh, into the rotation soon enough. Mm-hmm. Um, really, really fun. Paying homage to quite a few films that have yet to be mentioned as well. Um, but in, again, like you you mentioned about um, Black Christmas and things like that. Horror at Christmas seems to work. Like um, Krampus. Krampus was great as well. Mm. Which, it seems it's a genre all of itself. So we're going to really, I mean, I haven't in, included it because he gets into the kind of the Hallmark cinematic universe with all the Netflix films like the print, uh, the, Chris, the uh, Christmas Prince and all that kind of thing where they all shit. We know they're shit, but they're just part of the ambience, but they're never going to be a favourite. Um what came very close, though, since I've watched it for two years in a row and now three years in a row, is Trapped in Paradise. And <laughs> I know, I know, I know. It's it's not a good film in any shape or form. But there's something about it. And like we did it when we reviewed it years ago. I thoroughly enjoyed it from start to finish. And every time I watch it, I just stop, can't stop laughing, even at despite... Obviously, Danny Carvey and his idiocy. I love it too much. <laughs> it does, I probably love it more than anyone else in the entire world. I think so. Like, it's not even the good Nick Cage Christmas film, which is <laughs> The Family Man. That's the yeah. good one. So, I, yeah, that's terrible. Right. Matt, have you got any honorable mentions? Um, there's a few, I suppose, films over the years that, like, we've covered... So I was going to say The Family Man, like I enjoyed it way more than I had mm. any right to. Mm. Um, and I think the only reason it's not been watched like this year is just surely time um, because I've you know struggled. Um, Arthur Christmas is a pretty decent animated mm. um, Christmas film, to be fair. Did enjoy that. Um, it's just not my genre to be kind of, I think Love Hard, Sam really enjoyed. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I do. was a real fan of that and said it was excellent. So I, I think if you're, if you're after a film that is 
in the rom com sphere, but isn't a rom com. I think like you don't you couldn't go too badly with with Love Harder, I believe. Mm. I'd, I'd second and Stu will definitely third that. Yeah, that's um, a really good modern, as you say, almost a rom com come Christmas film. Really enjoyable that one was. <clears throat> so I've got uh, Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, which is a brilliantly funny mystery thriller neo noir with. Robert Downey Jr. and Val Kilmer in his absolute camp on. <laughs> it's set at Christmas, so that's the only link to it. But it's well worth a watch. It's brilliant. The Christmas episode of The Bear might be the best Christmas episode of anything. Absolutely outstanding, and you just feel the tension at the end like nothing else. But very much watch it with the rest of the series because it's it's excellent. Billy Wilder's The Apartment, which is a really good 1960 comedy film, which again, the main bulk of it is set on Christmas Eve, and it's all about sort of unrequited love heartbreak. Really good, excellent, probably Jack Lemmon's best film, I think. I don't think that's too controversial to say. Um, the Christmas episode of Inside Number 9, I won't spoil it because something happens and it's just excellent and that's one thing i think i've watched every year since it's been released brilliant uh it wouldn't be christmas if we didn't mention melissa joan hart so mm. holidays in handcuffs in which she stars alongside our favorite ac slater mario lopez um where she has to take somebody back as her partner to the family so she kidnaps mario lopez <laughs> and hence he's spending his holidays in handcuffs it's really fucking weird, but very good fun. And finally, the holdovers from this year. I think in years to come, this will probably be one of the all-time greatest Christmas films. Um, I think the reason it, it hasn't made my list is just that recency bias at the moment. If you ask me again in 12 months' time, I think this will probably be in my top five. I love a curmudgeon at Christmas time, and Paul Giamatti very much is that character. And wonder why. Yeah, I wonder why. And the woman who plays the, the cook whose son passes away in Vietnam, her story is just beautiful and moving. And how they, those two with the arsehole kids who just happens to have been left at boarding school, how they make this really ragtag little family is just wonderful. And I still don't understand why it's not been released at Christmas time in the UK. Well, we've still got to wait until next month before it's out. Absolutely ridiculous. But yeah, just a brilliant, brilliant film. So I think keep an eye out for that one. Yeah, I was saving that for Christmas Eve. Because um, they have that many for that silly game. Um, bro, that was my plan. I was going to watch that on Christmas Eve night. Because you've, mm. you've talked about it and there's been quite a few people talking about it. Today. But if we're bringing AC Slater into it, you know what I'm going to say now. It is foolish to have it done. It has to be done. It has to be done. And it has been done again this year. There is something very nice about that film. Um, it doesn't even deserve to be an honourable mention, but since you've brought him up, it's only fair. It, it is awful, but I've seen that as many times as I've seen good Christmas films. <laughs> I don't know why. There's just something about anything that Melissa Joan Hart's involved with that just needs to be watched, I think. Right, so my number one, which was your number two, Stu, and it is Home Alone. Um, I mean, this really is probably Home Alone 1 and 2 for me because I absolutely adore both of those films. Mm -hmm. They're two films that I can watch at any time of year, not just Christmas, but obviously they do have that extra importance at Christmas time. The first film is very much about the importance of family. Obviously, it all starts off with an argument. They get separated and it's all about them coming back together for the big day. That's the importance of Christmas. That's what Christmas really is about, isn't it? Like every Christmas film, that the nugget at, at the centre of it all is about the importance of family. It's about taking responsibility. It's about how Kevin grows up from being that spoiled kid into being a, still a kid, but, you know, a bit more of a manly child, I suppose you'd call it, having defended his house from those people. It's got wonderful turns from uh, Joe Pesci and Daniel Steele and Catherine O'Hara's just wonderful in it. The second one is not as good, but it does hold a special place in my heart for very obvious reasons that I've mentioned several times before. The setting of it is just perfect. And it, I loved the scene in the uh, toy shop as well, in that film. 
I don't know what it is, but I just find it absolutely magical. And I think that's why I've, I've always loved New York. It all stems from that movie. And every time I go there, even though it's not Christmas, it reminds me of Christmas just because it's Home Alone 2 every mm. time. I mean, that's always been my thing that I, I wanted to get. If I did do New York, I'd do it in winter because of that, for that reason that it's Home Alone 2. Not to see Donald Trump, obviously, but to <laughs> um, look at the big tree and all that kind of thing. But yeah, it, it's... Again, I, I've put them... I'll put Home Alone just because you, some years I like the first one better, some years the second. It's They're very interchangeable. I don't think there's been a year gone by where I've ever only watched one of them. It's always been, they've always both been watched. Um, they're just, they're timeless as well. They're absolutely timeless. Mm. And controversially, Home Sweet Home Alone from a few years ago is not shit. It's a direct sequel to the second one. Not the third and fourth and the spin-offs with the other people. Yeah. Buzz is in the house with Home Alone. So, you watch it, yeah, it's silly. It's a kid's film. But so are these. But it it doesn't seem to matter that they're silly kid's films because we were kids when we watched them. Mm. Um, but it, it's not the worst thing in the world, Home Sweet Home Alone. It's definitely worth a go. At least once. Um but obviously, it holds no candle to these two. They're, they're almost as perfect as you could possibly get. Mm. I think it being directed by Chris Columbus as well. Like Chris Columbus is the best director of young people's films, as far as I'm concerned. Like The best Harry Potter films were Chris Columbus movies. He's just got it when it comes to working with young actors. Perfect. And it's another film by John Hughes as well. Obviously, he wrote and produced it. And it was at the the heyday, but he knew he couldn't work with um, like a younger cast. That's why he handed it on. Apparently, Matt, I mean, are you? Is this a bit before your time, Home Alone? Do you not have the nostalgia for it, mate? But I don't have nostalgia for it. I, you know, I like it as much as anybody in terms of very quotable, and it's you know what isn't there to like about the slapstick funness of it. Um, it's just not kind of like ingrained in me as like a, a, a key memory of a childhood, I guess. But I, you know, I, it's certainly a fun Christmas film that is like iconic with the time of year. And I completely respect what it is. I just think like the majority of my list are not, uh, are probably set within the last like, uh, made in the last like 10, 15 years because it coincides with like meeting my now wife who obsesses over Christmas. So I've been forced, two footed to be like, watching these things like alongside with her and it just happens to be that these are the kind of things that she's watched whereas like Home Alone and some of the older ones yeah I get they're completely iconic I just never watched them when I was growing up as such mm, I get you I get you I think as a, for me I, I wanted to be Macaulay Culkin no. I still do I want to be Macaulay Culkin when I grow up because he's just the coolest so I think that also plays a part for me <laughs> I think that the fact that she um, Catherine O'Hara gave him his star as well, yeah. Hollywood Walk of Fame. That was that was a nice touch, and you can see that yeah. even all these years later, and all the stuff that he's gone through and whatever, <laughs> she's still like mothering him even now. It's it was quite sweet that was. Um, but you got the, the the Mega Drive game as well, the Mega Drive Home Alone game that we had. Mm. Surprisingly, not awful, which a lot of the film tying games back then were. It's like the toughest game you've ever played as well. It's yeah, impossible. Matt, your number one, please. So this is a um, beautiful film to look at. Is a bit of a tearjerker as well, but it's very funny and very sweet, and it is Klaus. I absolutely adore this film. It's mine and Sam's absolute favourite. Um, it's just so beautifully done. It's not slapstick, really, in the slightest, but it's just got a sweet story um, that, kind of ticks all the boxes of being funny but being heartwarming but then having an absolute sucker punch thrown in there just to bring you back down to earth as well so it's not sickly sweet um i watched this the for the first time i watched this i was like yep yeah, this is the christmas film that kind of gets me into the season and i absolutely adore it i think it's wonderful i don't know if this is going to be a hot take 
Is Klaus the best film that Netflix have produced? Could be. Could he, 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 but I'd also go as far as to say it's a massive sleeper as well. Yeah. Like, mm. um, I, I, I don't think many people, if you was to ask, if you was to do a family fortunes, you're not getting the, Gino's not giving you the top answer. That's for sure. Mm. Klaus. I think you know, it suffers for the fact that it's a Netflix film. Mm. Because you say, oh, what's that? It's on Netflix. Who's, who's it by Netflix? And then people automatically think, oh, the, the stuff with The Rock and, Mm. All that kind of thing. Um, it's probably it's got a chance that is. I mean, I, I have to think about it, but I remember when when we watched it when I watched it the first time around that that first year it got released, and I said at the time that it made me cry. Mm. And I've only watched. I kind of I tried to watch it again, but I wasn't in the right mood. But just going on that first time watching it, it was perfect, mm. and. You talk about an animation style, and we'll, we'll talk about that in about, in about 20 minutes' time, but perfect, again. It just works. It works, and it, it's not, it obviously doesn't look cheap either. Um, no, it, it feels quality, which is what it is from start to finish. I'd be interested when we talk about Christmassy stuff in 12 months' time, because um, J.K. Simmons, who plays Santa Claus in Clothes, He's going to be playing Santa Claus in The Rock's next film, The Red One. So I'm kind of intrigued to see mm. how J.K. Simmons translates because his voice sounds perfect as Klaus. Like mm. there's some kind of warmth to his performance, I think, as a voice actor in this. So I'm really looking forward to seeing him actually live action giving us Santa Claus. We'll have to put a pin in that for 12 months' time and then... Um, See where we before with that one. <laughs> Stu, number one, mate. Really, it's been hinted at. Um, the fact that it's got a rom com kind of semi named after it. Um, it's obviously Die Hard. Don't care. Not uh, not part of that argument. It's excellent. And for a long time, it was just my favourite film of all time outright, let alone Christmas. I love it. <laughs> I have to it was the first time I saw it probably way too young um he might have been like the tv version of it back then in the early 90s um but it's it, oh you said the elf's most stew film christmas film ever uh, this is kind of this has got to run for its money explosions 80s nonsense christmas songs bruce willis what more do you want it's I think last last year and the year before were the first time in about twenty years that I hadn't watched it, just because I wanted to just see if I could do it, like get through, go withdrawal symptoms and not watch it, and just see if it made any difference at all. Um, and again, a bit like Howl Alone, Die Hard Two is excellent as well. And it doesn't get the plaudits that it deserves for being a decent film in its own right and not just a retread of the first one. It's got a few little t twists and turns that you don't expect. Mm. Um, and they go together. You watch one and you watch the other. But the first one is a 10 out of 10 for me. Looking on IMDb and Ron Martos at the moment at the, the scores they were given. I don't know why, but I thought they'd get middling scores for both, like, you know, people being a bit hoity-toity about it because it's it's very much a genre film. It is basically a B-movie, let's be honest. Yeah. But no, it's got an 8.2 on IMDb, both the critical and audience scores on Rotten Tomatoes, 94% like the film. It is genuinely a properly loved movie. Yeah. And it almost feels like it's it gets overlooked, but I think it probably is a classic movie in its genre. I think maybe because it has been parodied because... Die Hard Inner became a staple of cinema, didn't it? Mm. You know, this is Die Hard on a plane. This is Die Hard on a train. Like it, it became something that everyone spoke about with the movie, comparing it to it. So that almost feels like it's taken away from the the gloss of the movie. But in actuality, it's excellent. And as you pointed out the other week, it was uh, Alan Rickman's first Hollywood movie, mm. and he absolutely steals the film. Like as good as Willis is. That is Alan Rickman's movie for me. He's just phenomenal in it. Yeah. 
Matt, fan of the Die Hards? I mean, it looks like it's bizarre as she's going to sound. Like, my first interaction with Die Hard was like, a, like you know when you used to get demos of games on when like playstation mag <laughs> yeah i had like the yeah i had that as like my first interaction with die hard and then like went on went on to watch it from there yeah i mean they're 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 fun films for what they are the whole christmas thing is the same thing you know it's the same argument as gremlins and whatever you don't don't really care for it it's just fantastic it's it's a scene it's a scene setter and it, it it's something that starts the christmas period as opposed to it being something that you'd like watch to feel Christmassy. I know that, that makes no sense, but um I get yeah that would know exactly what you mean. I'm like I'm all for it though all the same. If it's if it's if it gets you in the mood for the time of year because it me especially, Andy, I fear too, need some cajoling to be kind of in the mood and <laughs> Christmas. And if this gets you going and gets you on the way to it, then I'm all for it. Yeah. Absolutely. I echo those sentiments. Lovely. That's a great top fives each, I think. Some some interesting ones in there. I didn't expect Clay's to feature as highly, but and those are really good shows, actually. I think tremendous movie. No mention for the Polar Express at all, surprisingly enough. Is that the Tom Hanks one? Yeah. Mm, there's a reason for that. <laughs> like people like like I've heard about it more and more this year that you can take a kid like on the Polar Express, but it's eye-wateringly expensive, like in the hundreds of pounds. Yeah, it's just the most insane amount of money. Of it. Like, you know, um, Sad said Sam said something to me the other day. She goes, um, "Well, I'll be careful how I how how I word this here. <laughs> if, if I was if, if we were ever to go see a Santa, it absolutely has to have a real beard, and it can't have a fake beard. It was the weirdest, like." prerequisite that I've ever heard but then when I think about it like it just roughly makes sense like you absolutely need to have the authenticity of having a proper bearded Santa so buckle up Andy <laughs> I'm call call upon you yeah we'll see we'll see can he, can he just die himself like Roy Wood <laughs> right we better review this film um, like I said there's no point in doing a run through of the movie because it's Christmas Carol. Everyone knows what a Christmas Carol is. And if you don't, like, where the fuck have you been your entire life? <laughs> but, like, we'll get into the good, bad, cray. We'll just run into it. One of my issues with this film is we have seen this movie done a billion times before. And never has it felt as boring as it mm. did in this movie. But this was the most pain-by-numbers version of a Christmas Carol I think I've ever seen. There was just absolutely nothing about it that made me think that anyone put their stamp on this movie whatsoever. That's one of my biggest negatives about this movie. It's 80 minutes long or just under. And it's almost unwashable. It's almost the longest 80 minutes of anything I think we've watched. I was so thoroughly bored throughout this entire movie. It felt longer than Killers of the Flower Moon. Yeah, it really did. It didn't not... work at all for me. The fact that you, I had to subject my eyes to such awfulness because it was on YouTube and the fact that you could not get it legally as well anywhere. Not on Prime, not on Prime to rent or buy. Not on Apple to rent or buy. Nowhere has got a copy of this other than on Amazon DVD, which was about 10 quid and w wasn't even on Prime. There was it. It doesn't exist. It's like it's, they've tried to wipe it from history because it's so shit. And I think that's why it exists on YouTube, and the studios haven't tried to take it down because there's nowhere else to see it, and they would just rather get eyes on it, I suppose, and they don't care enough to try and monetize it. Mm. Mm, it's it's painful, like because you know the story like completely. You you, you think okay, well. They'll take a different twist on it. They'll do something different with it. All they do is bring a mouse in. <laughs> That's the summit of the creativity. And the mouse doesn't even play really a part either. I thought like the mouse by the end of it would be like a sub, like a huge crucial element to this story. Like the mouse ends up being one of the ghosts or something along the yeah. lines. But the, the mouse does nothing. That like, literally does nothing. Um, it's, not, it's like the mouse supposed to be us. Are we supposed to be looking at it through the eyes of the mouse? The voyeur. Yeah. 
quite possibly. But like the cast, so we've got Simon Callow, Kate Winslet, Nick Cage, obviously, Jane Horrocks, Michael Gambon, Reese Eifens, Juliet Stevenson, Robert Llewellyn. This has got a really good cast and you would not know it at all because it doesn't feel like anybody is used to any level in this. Everyone have, seems to be just mumbling throughout it. Having the ghost of Christmas present be Dumbledore really put me off as well. Um, I was like, what the, why is Dumbledore in this? Um, <laughs> it was just, it was just god awful. Like, like the, the animation style was really bland. Like, it was painful to look at. It was painful to listen to. It was just bore. Like, it wasn't like bad in terms of it being like the room bad. And it was just so bland. That's almost more, that's worse, if anything. Yeah. It being so magnolia as opposed to being like a, ridic- a disgustingly awful colour. It's just so magnolia or oh, so beige, isn't it? Hmm. I think I said it a couple of weeks ago about having seen it before that it it looks like that kind of animated show that you'd get that was imported from Belgium that you'd see on Christmas morning. And it looks like that, except it's got a Hollywood cast to it. So I don't quite understand why they made it look as awful as they did because there's no life on in the picture. Everything mm. looks very much, it looks 2D. And I, I obviously I know that it's cell animated. Well, I presume it's cell animated, but they've done nothing to lift it off the page and make your eyes want to actually watch it. It's the perfect. I'll put this on in the background whilst I'm pissing around on my phone because yeah. I'm not going to miss anything because I know exactly what's going on. So yeah, I can just do whatever and and I've watched it. That's it. Job done. I mean, from the from the thumbnail on that on the YouTube video, I thought oh. This looks a bit Gimli like. So you know Gimli, it might be it might be a nice change, and then it starts, and you think, is this like a student project? <laughs> because it doesn't look it doesn't even look as good as the snow matter, which is divisive in itself, how scratchy that is. Mm. But again, that it's it's at least got a style and Father Christmas as well. Um at least it's got a style, even though it's not that good. But it's like shit tinting, <laughs> you know, it's, it is like something that's just been knocked together and you think, oh, well, I know it's Victorian era, it's gonna, it's supposed to be drab, but it's not supposed to be colourless. I think that's the problem with it, it's just, it is, it's beige, it's, it's party sausage roll, that's what it is. <laughs> I'm just trying to find who actually made this film, because, I mean, it's obviously not going to be Disney, is it, so... I can't seem to see it on IMDb. But one claims it. Yeah, the, the, I think there's probably a reason for that. I guess it's just been left to languish and no one gives a shit about it. The budget was $12 million, apparently. Estimated $12 million. Yeah, with a worldwide gross of $266,000. Oh, my God. That's insane. Yeah. <clears throat> I was quite surprised, though. To learn that that Kate Winslet song that seemed to be everywhere like for a good few months, this was the film that it had come from. Yeah. And I own that CD as well. Of course you do. Mm. Yeah. Right, so have you got anything good to say? Because, I mean, we've said a lot of bad here. Matt, anything good about the movie? It made me laugh. In the same way, I, I mentioned it earlier that even though they're sickly on death's door, child, they <laughs> call him Tiny Tim. <laughs> the, the family call him Tiny Tim. Not like, oh, baby Tim, he's a baby, or like, no, that actually called him Tiny Tim, as if first name Tiny, surname Tim. And it's just even like he really was really. They've got these big name actors, but then they've got the kids from um, Another Brick in the Wall by Pink Floyd to voice a couple of the characters. Like the most generic 70s sounding children, British, like <laughs> school children, to like do some of the characters. Like it was a prize or it was part of a community project or something. So you've got the like, you've got, you know, people have stayed in the screen and then these like volunteer school children at the same time have just made me laugh. Hmm. Stu, have you got anything good about this movie? 
win the song. That's it. Uh, but I, I genuinely loved that song back, th- back then. I, had, I remember thinking for Kate wins it as well. And it, it kind of depressed me. No, this, this is not going to be one of them stories again. But it, after Titanic, he was kind of like, oh, yeah, I'm never going to meet Kate wins it, am I? It's not fair. Um, and when I saw, I saw the music video for this and didn't realise it was a film. I thought it was just a music video. <laughs> but I suppose that, that's the crazy as well. There we are. Um, but the good is that something that, that great song came from me. That is it. Yeah, I mean, th- this is going to be immediately consigned to the... I've seen it, but I couldn't tell you anything about it because it's already slipping from my mind a week after seeing it because <laughs> there's just nothing to it, is there? Um, speaking of Kate Winslet, I nearly put in the group earlier the picture from her new film. Um, yeah, she looks, she looks fantastic. Like, she's still holding up. She looks absolutely stunning. I, I love Kate Winslet. And I feel like she was completely underserved in this movie by not really being given a role. She was just sort of there in the background, wasn't she? So I really struggled to pick anything good in this movie. And as for the crazy, like, it's just crazy that nothing happens of interest in this movie. There's done nothing to make it their own, which is such a crying shame because, as I've said, they've made over 100 versions of A Christmas Carol. So why not try and do something a little bit different for a new generation? But, of course, there'd be another version of this film made within 12 months' time, and it moves on, and it's immediately forgotten. It's almost like an industry in itself. Mm, it is. It's it. I mean, I'm looking on uh, Wikipedia at the the list of different adaptations of it, and they've got like a number of live action and animated versions. There's opera, ballet, graphic novels, comedy strips, television shows where they've done episodes, podcasts. Three Ghosts apparently is a podcast that was done based on this. You are right. Like it's it's an institution, isn't it? A Christmas Carol. And everyone seems to have had their, their crack at telling that, that version of the story. It's incredible. Which is such a shame that this is instantly forgettable. <laughs> well, you mentioned, you mentioned it earlier. Spirited? I thought Spirited is. Yeah, of course it is. Yeah, it's a, a take on it, isn't it? Right, so Matt, wasn't it cage good or bad in this film? I mean, it's funny because... Um, I assumed this was the precursor to his his acting work as a vampire, um, like his accent. But this was like two thousand one, so <laughs> like, like he was a direct influence. In fact, uh, it's got to be a dud, hasn't it? I can't give you a score on this. Like, is anybody? If if you was to say anybody in this film, no matter what awards or anything, anybody is has won for their acting work, it's got to be a dud for me. N N slash A. Stu, I mean, his accent is awful. Um, I don't know what it, what it, accent it's supposed to be. Mm. Not that it really matters anyway. Um, but he's in it for, what, three minutes? And that is the thing as well. That they, they've got all these act, big name actors. It's such a short film. There's such a short amount for each of them to work with. It's still at the budget that it's got. And it looks as bad as it does. So where the, that money went, who knows? Um, and maybe it has been a tax write-off maybe that's why you can't find it anywhere mm. um maybe it's pre-willow willow so um nah he was bad he was he was a bad bad accent in the, in the bad bad film yeah like it, it just felt like he mumbled his way through it like he'd obviously got he cashed the check and that was enough for him he didn't really give a shit because his whole performance was just so one note so one level and i know he's not in it for very long but you look back at it and you wouldn't even particularly remember that he was he even did a voice in it. Right. Mm. There was nothing out of any substance to his performance. It was a bit of a stinker, really, I think, all round, to be honest. But he wasn't the only one, so I suppose they got paid and that's all that matters at the end of the day. Right, so that's us done for 2023. We'll be back in a few weeks looking back on the year, giving our top and bottom fives and having a look at the next six months that are due to follow. We are going to try and change the way we do things a little bit in the new year. But just watch this space and we'll we'll explain as we go along what we'll be doing. So just want to say a big thank you for joining us. We truly appreciate your time every week and 
you know, for this last year, it's been fantastic. So just thank you for being there. We we really do appreciate it. Uh, for this year, Matthew, would you like to say goodbye? Yeah, thank you to everybody that's uh, been with us since the start of this, uh, this project and to all the new people we've gained along the way. We're very, very happy to have you uh, into 24. But do us a favour and tell a friend so we can grow this this little silly little group click we have like that we have over twitter and everything else it's really great it makes our days as well so yeah tell a friend and get them on board as well Stu, would you like to say goodbye yeah so we should say happy new year as well since we're not going to see them we'll, we'll see them and you know what if anyone is mental enough to listen to this on christmas day mm. if you tweet me ac slater you i'll give i'll take a selfie on christmas day for you because it, it, that's a, some kind of mental level of commitment. If you, if, yeah, exactly. If you if you listen to this on Christmas Day, you're, there's either something wrong with you or you're escaping from the family. Either way, fair play. Yeah. <laughs> Goodbye. Happy New Year. Try. It'll be hilarious. Like if so, someone's got a, like a long drive now. <laughs> well, can't remember <laughs> Christmas Day, and then like in the car, the kids are playing. They go, shut up. We're trying to listen to Cage Fight. Because <laughs> the kids like the kids are making loads of noise on the drive up to your or something like that. <laughs> That'd be hilarious. Yeah, I mean I I'm gonna be looking at the numbers religiously all through Christmas Day just to see if anyone's been ridiculous enough to listen on on day and date of uh, it dropping, but it's bound to be somebody, bound to be. But yeah, they, again, thank you very much and have a wonderful Christmas and an excellent new year. I wish I'll see you very soon. And remember, be excellent to each other.